I'm so glad you're joining us on this third Sunday after Easter as we continue to explore the significance of Easter Sunday and also the significance of Good Friday. So we have a passage here uh, from a letter that John, the Apostle John, wrote to Christians in the early church. And here's what he said. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. John says that we've been made children of God. That was a title that to begin with was only used of Israel. Then later in scripture it was used specifically of David. Of course, Jesus is called the Son of God. So these are titles that pertain to our position in relation to God. And do you see what John said that we have become? We are the sons of God or the children of God. That's what we are. And that's a demonstration of God's great love for us. He has lavished us with love, the text says. He's lavished us with love and that's why we are the children of God. Text goes on to say, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Hey, the people out in the world are going to think we're a little peculiar, a little strange as children of God. And the reason for that is because they didn't know Jesus and they don't know God and they don't understand him. And so they're not going to understand us. We're different. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. In other words, this doesn't all make sense yet. But we know that when Christ appears, is a way of describing the second coming of Jesus. Paul also describes him this way. The idea that the second coming of Jesus is simply, he's going to appear. He is currently not visible, but one day he will be visible. He will uh, appear. Very simple description of the second coming of Jesus. Simply that someday he will appear. And what will happen then? The text says, we shall be like him. Well, why wouldn't we? We're also children of God, just as he is the son of God. And we will be like him when he appears. It says, for we shall see him as he is. It will appear, we'll see him as he is, and we will be like him. John went on to say, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now, this idea of purity goes along with uh, the Jewish understanding uh, of the world. The idea that there's cleanliness or the idea of being clean and the idea of being unclean. In a Jewish culture there were several things that could make someone unclean. For example, eating unclean food could make someone unclean. But also sin was something that would make a person unclean. And that's along the lines of what John is speaking of here. Uh, he's not concerned with dietary concerns. He is concerned with sin. And the image is that sin makes us dirty. It makes us unclean. But we can become clean. We can be purified from our sin. The idea here isn't just the idea of being forgiven from sin, but the idea of stopping our sinning, stopping our sinful ways, becoming obedient to Him. It says, just as He is pure, in other words, just as He is clean, just as He did what is right, we are becoming people who do what is right or who are pure. John went on to say, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is a failure to keep the law. Sin is a failure to do what is right. And it makes us unclean. But you know that he appeared, speaking of his first appearance, he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. 
Again, John isn't talking about taking away the consequence of our sin. He's talking about taking away sin altogether. The idea being because of what Jesus did on the cross, he defeated sin so that we don't have to live sinful lives any longer. We don't have to be lawless, but we can be people who obey the law, who do not sin, who are purified. So it's not a fictitious purification where we pretend everything's okay because of something Jesus did. No, it's a real purification. Because of what he did, we can turn away from sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning, you see. Because of what he has done, we stop sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, John is speaking in an absolute sense, but that doesn't mean that there's no nuance to what John understood. He says, who continues to sin either has seen him. So the idea isn't that we never sin, but there's patterns of sin in our lives that are done away with because of the power of the blood of Jesus. He liberated us so we don't have to continue our pattern of sin. But we can be set free from sin. We can work toward being set free from sin because of what Jesus has done. He said, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. Just as Jesus is righteous, we can be made righteous by doing what is right. How can we do that? By the power of the blood of Jesus. So it's not by our own ability or our own capacity, but because of the power of what Jesus has done. He has broken the power of sin so that you and I don't have to continue in sin, that we can purify ourselves just as he is pure by, as he explained earlier in his letter, by confessing our sins, he's faithful and just to purify us from our sins. Again, the idea isn't that he simply removes the consequence or the ramifications of sins, but that he frees us from sin altogether, that it might be something that we desist in doing. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the Lord.